worship today. All right, let's sing it out. Please open the eyes of my door. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. you've been with us before, we say welcome back. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. It is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. We're going to open us up in prayer this morning. Father God, uh, we just thank you for uh, all, you, all you are, God, just your character and your attributes we could sing about forever, God, but ultimately we do sing that you are holy. Uh, you're set apart. You're perfect above all other things, God, and we thank you for it. Uh, we just focus yet again on the gospel message this morning, God, that you have uh, come down to earth, that you have uh, died a death that we deserved, and that you were raised to new life so that we could have new life uh, with you, God. So we just celebrate what you've done on the cross and the, the defeat of the grave, God. We celebrate that this morning and every morning. Let us never lose sight um, of the freedom that we have in you, Lord. So we just ask that your spirit would come into this place, God that you have filled the sanctuary with your presence, God, as we gather as your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. See, on the hill of Calvary, my 
I'll give you an opportunity if you didn't receive your communion elements there on the back to the right at the uh, table there. So please feel free to go and grab those now. Uh, a part of us taking communion is remembering the sacrifice that was made for us, right? Remembering, remembering the fact that Jesus really did live, he really did die on that cross, but thank God he didn't stay dead, right? That he rose again from the grave and yet he lives to this day. I'm going to read this morning uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and, and I'll, I'll say this but as, we, as we turn there. Um, one of the things that, that, that was just an impression on me this morning uh, as I was, was thinking about the fact that, that we're going to do communion is that idea of being remembered and being thought of. See, sometimes I know we go through the motion of, hey, we, we, we take communion, this is something we do. Uh, you know, every so often to remember what Christ did. But when I was thinking about this idea of being remembered, what I thought about is the fact that 
God saw the condition we were going to be in, and he acted. He sent Jesus as a promise. He took the, the necessary step to act on our behalf. And that might not seem like a big deal, but think about it. It's one thing for us to respond to God because we need him, right? But the fact that he saw the condition we were in and cared enough to remember us and to act, to think about, I need to solve this situation for the condition of man's heart, and that he took the uh, initiative to act on our behalf. I bring that up as a, as a sign of trying to remember because in this room, people watching this online, I have no idea some of the things that people are going through right now. But in the same way he remembered us by sending Jesus, he remembers you as you're going through. In the same way you may be facing uncertainty, you might have, have things in front of you and on your plate right now, you're like, look, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I want you to remember that God is the most purposeful being around and he remembers you. He's with you. He didn't just solve salvation for us, but he also has a plan for what concerns you even day to day. Amen? 1 Corinthians 11.23, New King James, it says this. It says, For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For, an, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you reclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And we're going to stop here in verse 32. It says, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. As we prepare to take this cup, we're going to follow the advice from the passage. We're going to take a moment, and we're going to, for ourselves, examine our lives and pray to God. If there's something you need to repent, if there's something you need to ask forgiveness for, if there's something you need to let go, if there's something you need to leave at the altar now, now is the time to do that. And so for a moment, they're going to continue to play, but I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer. And so as you start praying, <laughs> you talk to God because you know your story better than I do. You know what's going on in your life. You know what situations you're facing right now. And so I'm just going to invite you to start praying. You can do it silently. You can do it out loud. And then I'll do a prayer for all of us. And then we'll take the communion elements. God, we come to you now thankful for the fact that you've told us who've placed our faith in you that all we have to do is repent. That we're not the sum totals of our mistakes. That that's not the end of our story. And that places where we've missed the mark in action, thought, word, or deed, that we can ask for repentance and we don't have to keep carrying that around, but we can continue on. And so, God, if there's things that we collectively need to let go of, we let go of it now. In the same way that the cross wasn't the end of the story, death wasn't the end of the story, it was a pause, and then we went over past that moment. I believe in the same way now, where we find ourselves, maybe those mistakes or whatever they are, aren't the end of our story. And so since we give them to you, as it says in Isaiah, we put you in remembrance 
You said you'll cast those things as far as the east is from the west. And so I thank you, God, not only for your forgiveness, but I thank you for your continued love. And so as we go forward, God, we're going to go forward victorious. We're going to go forward as those who know we have hope. And so, God, I just thank you right now for every single person under the sound of my voice that as we take this journey individually and collectively as a family, that there's something on the other side of where we find ourselves now. And so I pray that we keep going and keep trusting you. We thank you for your continuing love. We thank you for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take the bread. The bread represents his body, which was broken for us. And so I'm going to ask you to do me a favor before we eat the bread, is to break it, to remember that his body was broken for us. You may eat. In the same manner, he took the cup, which represented his blood. You may drink. And God, we thank you for doing what we couldn't do, for continuing to be faithful, for continuing to make ways, and for continuing to love us. I ask you to join us as we continue in worship.
hey, y'all. <laughs> How you doing? Well, well, first, I get to say a, a big uh, thank you to you guys. Uh, as you know, every year in July, I have a, a sabbatical. And so I get to have a, a month away with the family and all of that good stuff. Uh, I guess I get to preach to the kids because I don't get to preach to anybody. And the team doesn't really talk to me, but I, I will say I, I'm so thankful for it because um, to be a part of a church that, that, one, not only values the time of being able to recharge and rest, but also that uh, God sent people so that we don't miss a beat, even with me not being here. And so it's a huge, huge thing, and I never take it for granted. And so I just want to start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate all of you for that. Amen? Uh, so we are starting a brand new series. I guess, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I hadn't been here, right? We're starting a brand new series today. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. We're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. And so you can, you can turn there. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1 today. Uh, I'll give you kind of a, a little background about the book. So 1 Peter was written by Peter. <laughs> I know, it's like, it's, it's crazy stuff. No, it was written by Peter. Peter, one of the original 12 disciples, that Peter, Okay. This book was written by Peter, and he wrote it to uh, uh, the Christians who were kind of dispersed uh, near, the, near Asia Minor, kind of that Black Sea region at the time. This is like modern-day Turkey. And so he wrote it to them, and they were facing all these tribulations. They were facing trials and testings, which we'll get into uh, in a moment. Uh, but when we talk about Peter in and of himself, we remember that Peter was a fisherman, Right? He was one of the, the disciples, the brother of Andrew. Uh, 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 Peter was a part of that inner circle that Jesus had among those disciples. So even though he had the 12, sometimes he said, hey, the rest of y'all sit here. It's Peter, James, and John. And they would go and experience stuff, right? So he was that inner circle with, 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 uh, with Jesus. And most people, when we talk about his character, uh, Peter was impulsive. He was ambitious. Uh, he was self-assertive. He was quick to commit without fully understanding what Jesus was really saying at times. Uh, and although he doesn't write any of the Gospels, he's featured prominently in all these stories that we talk about and know, right? Peter was the one guy, the only other person that we know that's walked on the water besides Jesus, right? Until he sank, well, you know, just that part. Also, uh, he was the one who cut off the guy's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. You know, you need a good cutting friend with you, right? A good cutting saint, right? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> he was the one who denied knowing Jesus three times, but also he was the one that Jesus came back and restored after he was risen again. And so it's this Peter that we're talking about that wrote this story, and, 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 and I saw something that I thought was kind of funny. It may not be, because you know, I tell dad jokes, so whatever. But if Peter had a t-shirt, I think it might be this one. Can you put up my t-shirt for Peter? It says, have hood, have holy. That means pray with me, but don't play with me. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm just saying, maybe, maybe Peter would have a shirt like that today if he, because he was kind of, you know, he was, he was, he was kind of, he, he was, he was great, but he would do stuff, you know. What I like about Peter is all of his mistakes were out in front. All of his mistakes were seen by folks, but what's so cool about it is, in spite of all those mistakes, he ended up growing into being a great leader for the church. And I love that about him because if, if, if Peter can do it, you know, I didn't cut anybody yet. So there's still hope, right? There's still a chance. When we look at the, uh, uh, the book here uh, and to the people he was writing it to, they were facing this suffering and persecution because of their faith. And so there's two themes in this book that I want to kind of highlight, all right? There's kind of two themes. The first theme is uh, up here on your screen. Peter wanted to encourage the believers to persevere in spite of their own suffering, trials, and persecution. You're going to see this as we go, because what we're going to do is we're going to go, as we go through the next several weeks, we're going to go kind of line by line through the book. But pay attention to this. He wanted to encourage them. He says, look, I know you're going through suffering. I know you may be going through trials and persecution, but I want you to kind of persevere in spite of that. And... and the reason I think this is an important point is because, well, first, uh, this idea of, of persevere. One definition I saw for that said, is to continue to do or try to achieve something despite difficulty and discouragement. So if you find yourself in the midst of difficulty and discouragement, can you keep going and doing what God told you to do? 
That's this idea. As one of the 12 disciples, Peter understood that suffering uh, is something that's going to be experienced, but it's something that he saw firsthand. He saw suffering. He saw difficulty firsthand, and you know what he did? He learned how to endure it with joy and victory, uh, more so than with sadness and defeat. You say, well, Pastor, why is that a big deal? I think this is a big deal because if Peter is the one that is telling us about this, I think it makes sense or it matters who gives you advice. <laughs> it matters who's telling you to be encouraged because if they've gone through it, they can tell you from a place of experience, right? They can tell you from a place of wisdom. It's similar to if Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for 27 years, said, hey man, be patient. Patience, that, that kind of has some weightiness to those words, right? That, that kind of means something. It's like, okay, man, I got it. You know, that, that, that kind of weighs in a little differently. And so when we look at these words, we realize we're hearing from someone who's seen suffering firsthand and trying to offer us the hope that they experienced and learned in the midst of suffering. The other point, uh, or, or one of the other things that we'll see as we go through the weeks is this. We must pursue a lifestyle that embodies the values of heaven and not the values of the world. So he offers hope, he offers encouragement, but then he gives us an action item. This idea that it still matters how we live in the midst of difficulties. It still matters how we treat people in the midst of what we're going through. It still matters who we are and what we do, even in the midst of life happening. Simply put, we should use the example of Jesus, who didn't retaliate despite all that, went with, that happened to him, but instead we should use our trials as an occasion to testify about the power and the grace of our God. So, with all that being said, we're going to go right in uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, and we'll kind of, how this is going to work is we'll go through a few little scriptures and different sections, and then we'll talk about it. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go eat and do whatever we're going to do afterwards, right? I always get smiles for eating. I don't know what that is, but I love y'all anyway. All right. So 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 1 says this. It says, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the providence, uh, in providences, excuse me, the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. And I'm going to pause here for a second. In verse 1, what we see is the people scattered, right? They're scattered abroad as we talked about, right? It says what? Galatia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and it might as well say Ostel, Mableton, Smyrna, Atlanta. He's writing this letter to, to people who are followers of Christ who are, who've been kind of scattered, right? They, they, they're, they're not always all together. They're, they're scattered amongst this region. And he's like, I'm going to offer encouragement because I know you're all going through different stuff with where you find yourself. And verse 2 is something we shouldn't speed through. Can you go back to verse 2 one more time? Thank you. Verse 2 where he says, he says, God the Father knew you and, choose you, and chose you a long time ago. And you know, sometimes it's like, okay, this is the introduction of the letter. Let's get to the good stuff, right? Let, let's just kind of go past. But, but, but hold on, hold on, hold on. Slow down. It tells us that God knew us, chose us, and in that same verse, he made us holy. When we place our faith in Jesus, we're made holy. This is no small thing. You say, why, Pastor? Well, I alluded to it earlier when we were doing communion because it's one thing for someone to choose me based on, you know, the best version of me. Like, you know, when you go interview for a job, right, it's your representative that shows up. You know what I mean? Like, like the, the person who interviews is never late, right? The person who shows up first is, is the best version of you. And so for somebody to like the best version of me is one thing, but for God to know us, like know us, know us, the way some of your family and friends don't know you, know you, know you. And to still say, I chose you anyway. Do what? <laughs> he knows us. The stuff that we don't want people to know, he knows us and still loves us. This is, this, it, it's a huge thing, and we shouldn't just take that for granted. So, so can y'all just repeat after me? Say, 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 God knows me. 
Let's say it again. Say, God knows me and still chose me. He knows you and he chose you. This matters because what God does in our life is not based on our own worthiness. <laughs> but it's about God's goodness. It's about God's mercy. He ends verse 2 by saying, God, may God give you more grace and peace. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this on Wednesday night during Bible study, so I won't stay here. But the thing about God giving us more grace and more peace I mean, having more grace and more peace in our life is something I can't buy on Amazon. To have more of God's grace and have more of his peace in our life is just, ah, okay, I, I, I'll keep moving. Let's go, let's go to verse number three. Verse three says this. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Verse 5, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Okay, I know I'm normally not the repeater guy, preacher guy, but just again, say God is protecting me. Okay, I know I'm not asking y'all stuff sometimes. It's like, wait, you want me to say it now? Like, let's, let's just try it again. Say God is protecting me. Like, like, think about this. When you place your faith in him, he says, I'm protecting you. Listen, if you needed me to protect you, it's a problem, right? I mean, I, I can't be everywhere. I can't control everything. You know, it's going to be me, Ryan, and Trey trying to protect you. It's, gonna, it's not going to work out well, right? But the fact that God says, no, no, no. Not only do I know you and chose you, I'm also protecting you. I, 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 I'm protecting you. I, I, I'm intimately involved in what's going on with you, I think is a huge thing. When we look at this part here, he's talking about hope, and yeah, I'm going to be that guy today. Somebody say hope. <laughs> he's talking about hope here because he talks about this inheritance. The inheritance he's talking about is the fact that if you've placed your faith in Jesus, you get to go to heaven. He says that doesn't decay, it doesn't erode, and it does not change, right? He says that, that that's a hope that we have and we've placed our faith in Jesus, that our hope and our place in heaven is secure, and I feel like Peter is low-key setting us up here because of what he's going to say next. <laughs> I feel like he's setting us up here because he says, okay, I'm going to remind you of the hope that you have, all right? So we have hope, and everybody's like, hope. He's like, we, we have God protecting us, all right, protecting us. And then he starts to talk about the trials that we're facing. Look at verse 6. He says, So be truly glad. This is, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. <laughs> In verse 6 where he says, we should be truly glad, uh, some translations there say this idea of we should rejoice. And again, it says we should rejoice because we know the security uh, uh, that we have in Christ. But there seems to be a connection here that Peter is making. Uh, He's making a connection between the hope that we have and our ability to cope or endure the trials that we're experiencing. In life, we're going to have various storms. We're going to have trouble. We're going to have things that are going to happen to us, right? We're going to have things that we're going to have to deal with. And no matter what comes our way, when we see this scripture here, Peter is encouraging us that our ability to go on is tied to our understanding of our future inheritance. We are not those who don't have hope. And, and here's the thing, I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. In church, we don't like to talk about suffering, right? Like suffering can be terrible, not can be, it is terrible. 
And, and, and what Peter is saying here is like, listen, don't count as strange. Well, we'll see that when we get to chapter 4. But, but, but it's this idea that, hey, when there is trouble, when there is suffering or, suffering or when there is difficulty, one, don't count as strange, but two, don't give up. And I wish I could come up here and tell you, like, you know what? You're never going to have a bad day. Now that you're with Jesus, it's all going to be great. But that's not the reality of our walk. But the good news is that the suffering is not the end of our story. We don't have to stay stuck in that place of, oh, man, I'm just I'm going to have suffering, and there's never going to be hope, and there's nothing that's going to happen here. He uses this analogy in there where he says uh, uh, gold being tested, right? He says, um, he says our faith is tested similar to how gold is tested. And, and uh, it's a tough analogy to receive, but, but I, I kind of put this here, right? So when you look at how they test gold, fire is what proves where the gold is gold, right? Because, you know, if it's not gold, it's not going to make it, right? Similarly, adversity and trials. That's, going to be used, that's what's going to be used to test our faith. Wouldn't it be good to just say, hey, I got faith, but I don't need to test? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Wouldn't we like if he said we could just say we have faith and not have to endure the test? Right? But the good news is that, hey, the fire is used to test the gold, and when it's really gold, it goes through the fire. In the same way, when you go through the adversity and the test, it's doing something to your faith. It's cultivating something in you. But I'm believing that you're going to make it successful on the other side of it. <sighs> can, can I say something? Because I know it's like, oh, man, Pastor, this is, this is kind of dire. This is kind of dire here. It's not good. Can, can I tell you some good news? Y'all say, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon. I was losing them for a second. I, you know, Don, I got them back, I think. Here's the good news. Uh, go, go to the next one, please. Thank you. Trouble has an expiration date. Storms pass. And you know what else? Rain eventually stops. I, I'll say that again. I got the left side back with me because they were looking at me like, Pastor, we're going to throw a Bible up there in a minute. Come on. Trouble has an expiration date. Storms are going to pass. And rain eventually stops. Now, when we're going through it, it don't feel like it, right? In the middle of it, it's like, are you kidding me? Like, again? You know. All right, just, just a bad thought. But I always think about, like, you know, when Noah built the ark and, like, it rained for 40 days. I wonder at some point, they're like, man, it's raining again? It's like, okay, I'm sorry. I just keep, uh, never mind. We have to see this and recognize this to be true in our lives. We can't get so down in the dumps in the middle of the trials, in the middle of what we're facing, that we somehow allow that to seem bigger than the God we serve. Do you know that our God is bigger than any problem that you're going to face? We have to maintain our hope. We have to be able to push through the difficulty, and we have to be able to trust God even in difficult seasons, even through tough times, and use that hope to help you to overcome. This is what Paul was saying to them. And it's interesting, just as a side footnote here, when you look at that time in history, it doesn't show that the government was persecuting them like in some other parts of the region that the people that he wrote this to, but it was more so like individual people were just dealing with different stuff, different types of trials and whatever, and he tries to encourage them by reminding them the hope we have in Jesus. This morning we took communion, and it's a reminder of the hope that we have in him. And what I wonder is, are our problems causing us to not remember that we have hope that's bigger than what we have in front of us? Because you know what happens? We find ourselves in the midst of problems, and we say, man, this problem seems so much bigger than me. And I think, if I'm honest, that's where we're supposed to be. You say, what? Because if you had it figured out and worked out, would you need God? The fact that it's bigger than you but not bigger than him means we have to continue to trust in him. And, and I, again, I can't speak for you, but man, you know when I pray the most in the midst of trials? 
in the midst of difficulties? Nobody has to remind you to pray when it's going bad, right? <laughs> no one has to remind you to say, now, God, I need some help. You know, we're talking to Jesus on the way every, every moment. Like, we, we don't miss those moments. And I think there's something to what it does to refine and to activate uh, our faith and, and to build us up as we're going through trials, even though it's not fun. Let's go to verse number eight. I'm going to read uh, eight down to 12. Ah. So, 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 so wait a minute. B before I say this, Peter started this chapter here uh, reminding us of, of the hope that we have. Um, you know, he, he's saying, you know what, we're going to be able to overcome. And then just kind of look what he says here. Verse 8. He says, you love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious and inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Verse 10. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance of Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Um, can you go back to verse 8 for a second? I like for them to see it when I say this. So look at what it says here in verse 8. I'm going to read it again. He says, you love him, though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him, you trust him. And you rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy. Can you go to my bullet? He tells us here that our response in trials are three things. To love Jesus, to trust Jesus, and rejoice in him. He says we should love him, we should trust him, and rejoice in him. Can I be honest? I know this sounds counterintuitive. You're like, love him, trust him, and rejoice. You know what I'm dealing with? You want me to do what? But it's like Peter is saying we must look at every circumstance we face and try to determine how can we bring God the most glory through this circumstance. How is God going to get glory through this Paul echoed a similar thing when he said, man, when I'm weak, that's when God is strong. I'll say this. Next point. We have to make this decision to trust him, and our decision to trust God must be a choice and not based on our feelings. And, and, and for some of y'all, right, when I say that, you're just like, What's the big deal? But for those of you who are going through and are like, either we're going to trust God or I'm just going to throw the whole thing away, right? <laughs> I, I, maybe I'm, on, I'm ready to give up. But you can't give up. You have to say, I'm going to trust him, not because I'm tired, not because I'm frustrated, not because I'm hurt. Because it'll be the very person who hurts you where God says, hey, I need you to pray for that person. And you're like, now see God. <laughs> The way my, uh, my, 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 you know, my faith set up, I don't know if I'm ready to pray for them right now, you know, maybe later, you know. But he's like, no, 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 I need you to pray for this person. The very people who have backstabbed you, maybe at, at work or something, he's like, no, no, I need you to still treat them with love. And again, I got to trust God that you're telling me what to do, even though my flesh wants to, you know, like slap people, but maybe, you know, Maybe it's a soft slap. I don't know. You want to retaliate. You want, you want to do something. But here's what you can do. Trust God and do what he's telling you to do. Wow. I'm like, Pastor, I didn't want to hear this today. I was really looking forward to slapping somebody later, man. <laughs> when I think about this, uh, this, this bullet point here, I think about my parents. Because as a kid, my parents made it uh, uh, abundantly clear 
that uh, me obeying them um, or doing what they told me to do was not based on my feelings. <laughs> you know, my mom would tell me to do something. I couldn't be like, you know, mom, I've been really thinking about what you said, and I don't feel like cleaning up today. <laughs> Now, I don't know how your, your households worked or, you know, where y'all grew up. But where I grew up, it just did, that didn't really, you know, didn't really fly. You're like, Dad, you know what, I don't feel like cutting the grass today. He'd be like, feel? <laughs> you know, I, I probably can't say the rest of what he would have said after that. Good thing Dad's not here today. He'd be like, you told that story, but, you know. Our obedience and trust in God cannot waver based on how we feel. We have to be obedient to what he's telling us to do, and we have to trust him. Uh, look, y'all know I'm from Decatur, for real, for real. We have to really trust him and do what he's telling us to do. Uh, somebody say, why? Why is this an important thing? Why does this matter? Because suffering is terrible. And if your faith is not rooted, you'll let your emotions and your feelings cause you to waver. Y those things will cause you to walk away from God when things get uncomfortable, and we can't do that. So, we got one little section left, and this is like my favorite part, because it's like, okay, Peter's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of the hope you have in Christ. We're going to talk about the trials that you have, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some encouragement to overcome those trials, but now he's going to give us some action items. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things you just, you know, we just say, ouch, if we can't say amen, it's all good. But he's going to challenge us here when we get to verse 13. So look at verse 13, and I'm going to read down to 16, 13 through 16. So look at what he says. So he said all that, and now he says this. He says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Say, so, well, now, like we could have just, you could have just skipped that part, Peter. Why would you throw that in there, right? He's like, he said, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. He says, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Verse 14, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Oh, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And the church said, ouch. Can we say that? Just ouch. Amen. All right. Here we go. Uh, uh, Audrey, walk back, with it. walk back through the verses with me as I go through. I won't read them, but I'll just have them up for reference. So verse 13, I love how he starts verse 13. I mean, you know, love, right? He, he says, so prepare uh, your minds for action. And, 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 and again, I know Peter wasn't from Atlanta, but it felt like he was saying, you need to get your mind right. Yeah, does that make sense? Like, you know, get, 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 you, you got to get your, your, your thoughts together here for what is to come. And he says to prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. When I think about this, what I think about is sometimes when we go out and serve, um, say if you're going to serve in a tough area, maybe with people experiencing homelessness or, or somewhere in, a, in another country or whatever it is, often what happens is we do this thing that I, I jokingly call uh, we go in ministry mode, right? If you go on mission somewhere, you go in ministry mode. And what I mean by that is what you'll say is, okay, I know like people might say some crazy stuff or people might act a certain way or, 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 or things might smell a certain way, but you already set your mind. You say, you know what? I'm not going to respond to that. I'm going to love on these people. Whoever God puts in my path, I'm, I'm going I'm to be, be, be great to them and all of that stuff. And, and so what we're doing in that moment is you're already setting your mind, right? You're setting your mind and using self-control to say, I'm going to act a certain way towards the people that I get to serve. Right? You see that. We're already doing that. And so, hold on, hold on, hold on. So if we can do that when we go on ministry, that means we have the ability to do that in our lives, right? Because we can't just say, okay, we're going to a third world country to serve, and so, praise God, I'm not going to let other stuff bother me. I'm going to love on everybody else. But then we come here and say, now, Pastor, I was going to do that, but, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, <laughs> and I have to see them. No. We have to have this mindset as we go to work, as we deal with certain people, and even if we find ourselves, and I say especially when we find ourselves 
having to deal with the difficult people in our lives. What do we have to do? Prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. And again, when he say action, not like to fight them. You know, I just want to make sure I bring balance, right? You know, lighten up, guys. It's okay, right? <laughs> Prepare your mind for action, all right? We recognize when we look at this that our hope is not in the other person or in the situation, but our hope is in Christ, which he already told us earlier in this chapter. And so uh, since there's only so much we control, we can control, what we recognize here is we have to take heed of this advice and make sure that we're exercising self-control. We have to exercise self-control. We, we, we have to exercise self-control and make sure... Uh, that we're walking in love with folks. In verse 14, he says we can't slip back into the old ways and the old habits. And you say, well, how do we do that? He just gave us the answer before he set us up with the question, right? How do we do that? By preparing our minds and exercising self-control. If you were on a diet, then you say, okay, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, you know, prepare my mind and exercise self-control and so you can't go to cami cakes and, and, and mess up the whole plan, right? Right? You, you, you have to, right, set your mind and exercise self-control. And if you can do it in one area, I believe you can do it with the help of the Holy Spirit in other areas of your life. But it's something we have to be intentional about. We can't just let this slide through. In verses 15 and 16, the last part of it, um, there's a call for us to be holy because God is holy. And here's just the point that I want to highlight when we look at this, right? We must pursue a lifestyle that embodies the values of heaven and not the values of the world. I said that earlier as a theme, but here it's just illustrated when he says we have to be holy because God is holy. And here's the thing. Our measuring stick for who we are, how we act, and how we treat people is not other people. We have to walk in love because he is love. We have to forgive because he told us we have to forgive. It's not enough to say, well, I'm better than them. No, they're not your standard. And so we're called to do something more. Our standard, our standard is holiness and not to just be better than other folks. And so with that, I have three last questions for you for today. And so I would love for you to maybe write them down, put them in your notes on your phone, whatever it is, and I want you to consider these uh, as you go forward. You ready? Yes? No? Maybe? Let's try it again. Y'all ready? Yeah. Okay, look, I'm keeping you from getting out of here. No, I'm just kidding. Here we go. First question is this. How can you prepare your mind for action and better exercise self-control with what you're currently facing? Got to make it practical, right? Got, we got to get off this page, right? How can you prepare your mind for action? So it's one thing to think in the, you know, the great by and by. But no, with what you are facing now, how can you prepare your mind for action and better exercise self-control? First question. Second question is this. When it comes to trials, do you focus more on the problems or the hope that we have in Christ? Because he's telling us we have to focus on the hope. And so now we got to evaluate. Man, am I so focused on this that I'm forgetting to, to, to take this to God and trust him with it? And, and here's the last one. And y'all say, well, Pastor, you would say that. But it's based on what we read. Is there an area that you need to repent to God? That last section, he says, don't slip back into those old habits, right? And when I say that, this isn't a, um, what's they used to call it when I was growing up, like the fire and brimstone type message? No, 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 that's not the point. This is more so an accountability thing. Because I realize often if we go to church or we watch it online or whatever, people assume that we're doing the right thing. And, and what I recognize by him saying this is that it's a slippery slope to fall back into bad habits. And so sometimes you just need somebody to ask you, like, hey, have we fallen into that bad habit, you know? And, and I say this jokingly because, you know, just to lighten the mood, you know, are, are we eating a whole pint of bluebell every night before we go to bed, you know, whatever it is? 
I'm like, they got this banana pudding one that is like, <sighs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, focus, focus, focus. But seriously, is there an area where we need to say, God, I need to repent for what's going on here? Man, I, I, I'm falling back into them old ways like he talked about in this passage. Or, just to add on to that, is there a place that you need to ask for help? Say, so found myself in a slippery slope. And so if, if you do, just, just two quick points. One is to say, okay, God, help me with this. Holy Spirit, help me to overcome this. But two, I would challenge you to find someone to help hold you accountable. Amen. I said a bad word. I said accountability. Lord, the looks I got. All right, but that being said, now I get to ask you this. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, uh, in, in a moment I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. All right? When we talk about this hope, the hope starts with you making a decision to place your faith in Jesus. And what does that mean? Because I know sometimes we talk in Christianese. Placing your faith in Jesus means that we believe Jesus really did live, he really did walk this earth, he really did die on the cross, to pay the price for our sin penalty. He was buried for three days, he rose again, and by believing in the truth of that and placing our faith in him and making him Lord of our life is what gives us access to go to heaven. When we die, you're gonna go to heaven or to hell, and hell wasn't created for us. It really wasn't. Jesus paid the sin penalty for us, and he says, if you place your faith in me, that gives you access to heaven. And so I know look, social media, the internet, everything, they say, oh, there's plenty, plenty of ways to God. And Jesus says, no, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so we have to place our faith in him. And so if you hadn't made that decision, I may never see you again, but if you make that decision today, I will see you again. And so when I ask that, you have to know that you know that you're saved. He said in there that we're secure, right? Once we make that decision, it's secure, so we don't have to waver on it. Like I, like I always often tell the story about when I first got saved as a kid, uh, as a teenager, um, Every time I went to like a, a youth event, I'd be like, oh, let me get saved again. I just want to make sure, right? I, di I didn't know that, no, once I'm saved, you're sealed. It's, it's secure. But if you hadn't made that decision, please, ma'am, please, sir, get saved. Second. Oh, and in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing, and you can come down and make that decision. Someone will walk you through that process when our prayer counselors come down. Second is uh, if you need to rededicate. Rededicate is for those who say, well, pastor, I've already made the decision. I've placed my faith in Jesus. But if I'm honest... I'm not living the life that I should be living. Maybe, maybe life has happened. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's been stuff. Maybe I find myself uh, uh, from loss, from bad choices, from drugs, from sex, from whatever. I find myself in a place where I just know I'm not living the way I should be living. And you feel like you're stuck in life. You feel like, man, I can't get back. Or maybe God doesn't love me. And those are lies. God loves you with a never failing, undying love. And he says, repent. Get up and keep going. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to sit and live a life stuck. And so if you need to, if you say, man, I want to recommit and rededicate myself to the things of God, man, we'd love to walk you through that process. It's like the Father sitting here with open arms waiting for you and saying, come on, let's keep going. So if that's you, in a moment when we stand, I'm going to ask you to come down and make that decision. Third is prayer. If you need prayer for anything, we know prayer still works. Uh, and so if you need prayer for anything, there's nothing too small, nothing too large. We would love and count it a privilege to be able to pray with and for you. And lastly, if God's called you to be a part of this church, uh, here's what you need to know. Uh, no matter who's up here on Sundays and Wednesdays, whatever, our, our, our job and our aim is to teach the Word of God in a simple and an uncomplicated way so you can understand it and go live it. Two, we are a church that, that is intentionally focused about making a difference in our community because we believe that's what the Bible tells us to do. And three, we are a church made up of people from different ages, different backgrounds, from different people, uh, like I like to say, from different origin stories. But God has brought us here together to bring our gifts and talents to make a difference inside this place and beyond these walls. And if you say, man, I love to be a part of that, we would love to have you. And so, four things. If you need to get saved, if you need to rededicate, if you need prayer, or if you want to be a part of this church, uh, we would love to have you. So I'm going to ask at this time, if you are able, can you stand where you are? I'm going to ask my prayer counselors to come down and get in position. And if you need to respond to one of those four things, come on down, please, at this time. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. And may what I behold 
still my anxious heart. Take what I know and break it all. 